We're now in the last month of the year, and it's unlikely that at the beginning of this year, many would have believed the resilience of our housing markets. Our property markets reset at the beginning of the year, and house prices have risen for eight months in a row now. Despite all those interest rate rises, despite high inflation, the reduced borrowing capacity that a lot of us have had to endure, and a media keen to warn us that our housing markets would crash. Now, remember all those commentators who tried to scare us about mortgage stress, a fixed rate mortgage cliff, even a recession. Even the Reserve Bank 12 months ago was telling us how our property markets were going to crash. Yet, despite all the challenges thrown at them, property values in our combined capital cities have kept rising, albeit at a slower rate over the last few months. And joining me today is Dr. Nicola Powell, Domain's Chief of Research and Economics, to discuss Domain's latest house price report on covering the latest developments in our housing and our rental markets and much, much more. So if you're a prospective home buyer looking for valuable insights, a seasoned investor looking to navigate the markets more confidently, or simply just curious about the current state of the housing markets, I'm sure you're going to get some insights from my chat with Nicola. So let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. Australians are moving house less frequently. The median tenure for houses is nine years and for units eight years, according to Domain's latest tenure and profit report. Now, another interesting report from Domain, their latest rental report, shows that Australia remains firmly a landlord's market. According to uh, Dr. Nicola Powell, Domain's Chief of Research and Economics, we need an extra 70,000 rentals just to balance out our rental market. Now, these reports contain some fascinating insights. So to unpack them, I'm again joined today by Dr. Nicola Powell. Hi, Nicola. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much for having me on again. Well, it's always fun chatting with you. And this time last year, when we spoke, if we went back a year, the Reserve Bank suggested house prices would plummet 15% to 25%. At that time, the National Australia Bank said house prices would fall 20%, Westpac 16%, ANZ thought they'd drop 18%. They were concerned about rising interest rates. They thought that would stifle our property markets. But, 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 Nicola, clearly that hasn't happened. And now all the economists and the banks have changed their views and the property bears have gone back to hibernate in their cages. What do you think has been the key drivers of the resilience of our housing markets this year? You know, I think it has been a very interesting period of time. And I definitely think that resilience initially was due to a lack of listings. There really wasn't enough stock across our housing markets, which created greater buyer competition and and meant that we were seeing, you know, uh, strong auction outcomes and, and some really great results at auction. And you tend to find that sellers do pull back uh, when prices are falling or there are uncertainties in the economy. And we saw that. I mean, obviously, prices did pull back over 2022. But I think what we've started to see now is listings have risen. There is more choice. Um, We're seeing more homes go to auction, but we're consistently seeing prices rise. And, you know, you you read uh, as much as I do, you know, the chatter around the fixed rate cliff and the impacts that that would have on our housing markets. And the interesting aspect of this, we track distress listings. And pretty much every single month this year, we have seen the proportion of distressed listings across our capital cities decline. And Sydney is one of those. You know, distressed listings are only 3.1% of total listings in Sydney. And that's shrunk from 5%, which was in back in January of this year. Well, that fixed rate cliff really was a myth. I can understand why people thought that going from a fixed rate of 1% or 2% to now the variable rates, which are four percent higher than that could have caused distress but we had time people had time to sort their finances out a lot of people stashed their cash in the reserve bank's latest financial stability report showed that australian households 
have been resilient because they've had that cash saved and they're able to cope with the erasing interest rates and there's still a bit of cash left in the system. But it's really been the supply and demand ratio, as you've suggested. People are still wanting to buy, huge population growth. And the fact that, in fact, we're wanting different sort of houses at the moment, aren't we? COVID has left us wanting bigger houses and usually a few less people per household. Yeah, so that was one of the the trends that we saw. And it's always fascinating when you see those demographic shifts occur within our housing market. And we saw fewer people uh, per dwelling over the the pandemic. We wanted that that greater space. The latest research from RBA suggests, though, that we are starting to see um, an increase in the number of people per dwelling. And in regional Australia, it's actually back to what it was pre-pandemic. But we're still seeing fewer people per dwelling across our combined capitals but it is starting to rise. And I think that's really an interesting aspect and will probably feed into the whole conversation we'll have around rentals. About rentals. Sure. So again, the number of people per dwelling, I said few less, that's not actually the case, but it's a small percentage less. But it means having said that there's now a requirement for more dwellings just to feed the, the same number of people. But I found your new domain tenure and profit report in Lightning. It may feed into this a bit because it shows Aussies are moving house less frequently. What do you think is behind this trend? Why are we moving less often? This is fascinating because we did historical analysis as well and looked back, you know, 20 years in terms of what was the average tenure. So tenure basically means, well, how long on average is, uh, are we staying in our homes for? And consistently over time, over the last 20 years, we've seen tenure gradually increase. Now, what you tend to find is slight fluctuations in tenure because what you tend to find is they do follow property price cycles. And that makes sense because if, prices are falling, you are likely to delay your selling decision. Or if prices are rising, it can speed up your decision to sell because you want to, you know, catch it while the iron is hot, as they say. But I think there's other things in this, because when you look over that trend historically, tenure has been rising. It's been rising for houses, it's been rising for units, and pretty much across all of our our cities and into regional markets. I think it says a lot about housing affordability challenges and transactional costs, which, Michael, we've spoken about many times before. And I think it feeds into Stamp duty, those high costs associated with transacting homes, really is a disincentive to move. And I think what people do is they either purchase a home that far exceeds their current needs because they're planning a family down the track. And what people are trying to do is actually reduce the amount of stamp duty they pay over the life cycle of owning homes. So, you know, I I think it really speaks to housing affordability and probably the need to address, uh, you know, and have some stamp duty reform. Now, have your research shown a noticeable difference between how long people tend to own houses compared to apartments or units? Yeah, and, and look, this will probably be exactly what you would expect as a, you know, as as an expert in the market, Michael, because houses, generally speaking, are owned for a longer period of time than units, because you know I think this fe- feeds into the theory that units are often used as that stepping stone to get onto the property ladder, and you know also that laddering effect that you see in the, in the unit sector, because there are a variety of different price points and different steps that you take even in the unit sector from that very entry level unit price, you know, up to a boutique development, which obviously costs a you know vast different price point. But generally speaking, units have a lower tenure than houses. And I think, you know, houses generally speaking probably speak to suburbia. It speaks to families. It speaks to commitment to the community, particularly with school catchment zones. If you've got, you know, school-aged children, you're lock, stock and barrel committed to that school catchment zone because, you know, you're on that journey of schooling for such a long period of time. I guess it falls back to demographics, doesn't it? Demographics very much does drive our property markets in the various stages of life. So in the early stages of life, you're still finding out where you want to live, how you want to live. You you uh, then latch on to, uh, oh, that was a terrible description, latch on to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but you get married or partner up with somebody. I don't know where that came from, Nicola. And then you have different <laughs> needs and requirements. Then you're in family formation stage. And that's where a lot of millennials are at the moment. So the apartment lifestyle doesn't suit them as much. And then as you get older, you do tend to stay in the house a lot longer. Baby boomers haven't moved to sea change or tree change like people predicted. A lot of baby boomers want to stay in the same areas. And there's actually uh, difficult finding the right 
apartments to downsize. I think there's a shortage in, around Australia of the right sort of medium density apartments for baby boomers, but they still want to stay where the, the same hairdresser is and the dentist and around where their kids are. So there's no doubt that they're going to stay in their homes longer and they're going to have a lot of spare bedrooms. Mm, absolutely. And, and and actually, we do have a misallocation of housing in Australia. We do have a lot of spare bedroom capacity. And that does feed into affordability issues. And, you know, I think it speaks to the need to densify some of our inner and middle ring suburbs to ensure that there is the right type of housing to allow people to downsize, because there will be some people out there that want to downsize but they're just unable to because there isn't that choice for them. There isn't the stock. Um, and it's really interesting you pick on those demographic trends because that's exactly what we found is um, lower tenures tend to be associated with a younger demographic, particularly uh, rental markets also, or, or areas that are associated with high levels of rentals. And, you know, those areas that have higher tenure tend to be higher priced markets. They are in suburbia. They're, uh, you know, it, it really speaks to that kind of family demographic. What about capital cities and regional locations? Was there a noticeable difference there? Look, there was. Interestingly, let, let's just take New South Wales as that, that case study. And Victoria was actually very similar. You know, we had a tenure for houses in Sydney as, at 10 years, and the tenure for houses in regional New South Wales was eight. So actually, you know, two years lower. Similar in Victoria. So in the city, it was nine years for a house. And in regional Victoria, it was eight years. You know, I, I, part of me goes, I wonder if this is really speaks to affordability, because obviously, you know, regional markets are more affordable. Is there more of a lathering effect where people can, you know, upgrade more frequently? You know, and I think particularly Sydney. Sydney has the longest or one of the longest, I should say, not the longest. It's one of the longest at 10 years out of all the cities. And I think that really just screams to the affordability issues that are within the Sydney market. Now, I'm going to link to your report in Domain in the show notes, but what I found interesting was you didn't just look at tenure, but you also had to look at profitability when people sold their properties. Did you notice any interesting trends in the number of sales that were made at a profit? Yes, and I, I know this won't surprise you either, Michael. You know, the large proportion of sales that were, or resales, I should say, were a profit. And that speaks to the fact that, you know, we see a property market as a way to build financial wealth. And you can understand that when you've got the lion's share of sales are actually at a profit. So 96.3% of properties being resold sold at a profit. So only 3.7% sold at a loss. Now, it's capturing a really interesting period of time because it does capture part of that downturn. So this was looking at the, the previous financial year. And Sydney did have an increase in loss-making sales. So almost 5% of sales in Sydney were at a loss. But again, I'll remind listeners that 95%, just over, were profit making. We saw other markets like Darwin had a much larger proportion of loss making sales at 15.1%, but we had some markets where over 99% of resales were at a profit. So that was Canberra, that was Hobart and Adelaide. Over 99% of homes being sold at a profit really speaks volumes to the strength. I also think it showcases that people are not, you know, they don't have this quick flick mindset. And what I mean by that is they're not purchasing a property and then, and then selling it quickly. It showcases that people ride the waves of a price cycle or two and they reap the benefits of, of equity growth, capital growth on their home over a period of time. Now, you've got a very detailed uh, chart or table in your report, so I'm going to, as I said, link to it because it actually shows if you want to have a look at your particular suburb, see what those statistics show, what sort of profit people made when they sold their property and uh, the length of tenure. And clearly it does vary. We talked about Sydney, we talked about Melbourne, but in fact it varies within uh, each state, doesn't it, related to, to different suburbs. Now, we talked about... Clearly, it makes sense that if you own properties longer, there's more profit. But what about houses? How did they perform with regard to profitability, Nicola, compared to apartments? 
some of the figures, uh, Michael, are absolutely eye-watering. So when you look at the houses, it absolutely dominated in terms of the dollar figure of profit. And we had two areas in Australia that took out the top spot. One was in New South Wales and one was in the ACT. So Borkham Hills in Sydney and the Inner South or South Canberra, it's known as the Inner South, two locals. Both these two areas had a median profit of $600,000. Now, that means that there were a big chunk of people actually walking away with much higher profit than that. But there were also some that were walking away with a, a, a lower level of profit. Well, than that's that. how averages work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and interestingly, there were some areas and we took the median. Um, so whether it was a profit or loss, and we because we really wanted to represent the market overall. We didn't want to hone in on a, you know, 3% of sales, et cetera, were selling at a loss and hone in on what that was. We wanted to look at the bulk of what was occurring across the different regions in Australia. There was one area, you know, there was a couple in some regional uh, areas in Darwin, but there was one area in Sydney that had actually a net negative. So a loss, the median was actually a loss and that was Mm. for units. And that was in Pennant Hills and Epping. That loss was $5,000. So a minimal loss. But I think what that showcases is there would have been some people selling their units in that area for a bigger loss than that. There sure. would have also been some There's profit. also the opportunity cost lost and the, the in and outgoing costs. And sure, sure. So I guess there is a lesson behind that that You've got to be very careful in selection of locations. You can't talk about the Sydney property market or or the Canberra property market, can you? You absolutely cannot. There are multiple property cycles going on within a city. Uh, You know, it's about knowing your market dynamics at a local level or speaking to experts that actually help you on that buying journey. Sure. Well, that's why it's important to understand these sort of figures, but also the demographics and the trends going forward. Now, over the last year, we've talked about how property prices have risen, but in comparison, rents have actually skyrocketed due to a shortage of available housing at a time of strong population growth. Now, Domain regularly brings out rental reports, and in your latest rental report, you broke down how rentals are performing state by state. Can we maybe just start with a quick overview, Nicola? Yeah. And look, I was quite surprised, actually. It takes a lot, actually, to surprise me. You know, I'm 10 years of analysing, you know, Australia's housing market. Last quarter or over September, we saw Australia's vacancy rate drop to another record low. And I, you know, am quite concerned by this because initially we were starting to see the vacancy rate increase. Now, the the, the fundamentals of what's behind driving that are, you know, I can, you know, can completely understand. But I think it really showcases that this rental crisis is, is, you know, we are in it. And the fact that we've got Australia wide at a record low and we are seeing Rental prices continue to rise. It's the longest stretch of continuous rental growth that we've ever seen. Uh, House rents have now risen for the 10th consecutive quarter. 10 quarters of rising rents. Quarters, not months. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. quarters. Unit rents have risen for nine quarters in a row. So, you know, this is affecting pretty much all capital cities. I think the only ones that are kind of bucking that trend were Hobart and Canberra, and they have slightly higher vacancy rates than the other capital cities. But generally speaking, there's still a landlord's market and everywhere else is a landlord's market across Australia. So, and look, I I always think, you know, devil is in the detail here. We actually saw overall across the combined capital cities that the pace of rental growth over the most recent quarter eased. But I think that it's important to note that while it eased, Rent still increased 3.4% over the quarter. Now, that is still significantly higher compared to what we would normally see. You know, when you look back over the 2010s, we saw house rents increase by 0.4% on average each quarter, and we saw unit rents increase by 0.6% over each quarter. They're still rising 3.4% over the September quarter. So, we're just moving away from the extremities that we saw over 2022 and earlier than this year, but they still remain high compared to historical standards, and that's very concerning. Well, when you look back at history over the previous decade, rents didn't keep up with inflation. Landlords had to drop rents over the COVID period to help tenants through the challenging times. But even prior to that, uh, I remember a recent survey done by the PIPA, the Property Investment Professionals Association, and Peter Kalisis, that showed that rents didn't keep up with inflation. Now, this is a bit of a catch-up, and it's definitely causing some 
challenges for tenants. I was interested to read your thoughts that Australia desperately needs up to 70,000 rentals just to balance out the market as opposed to actually taking into account our growing population. I mean, clearly an element of this is all those students who've come back, the net immigration figures have been very high, so they've taken up the apartments. And even the permanent residents who've come to Australia, in general, even though many of them have got money to move into accommodation, they're not prepared to do it straight away to buy something. They're they're, they're still wanting to find their feet, see where things are. So there's been a huge demand on rentals. But I can't see any end in sight to this, Nicola. No, I, it is um, a very challenged rental market, and I, 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 you know, I think both sides of the coin. You know, it's been um, very challenging for tenants, but equally, it's been challenging for investors in terms of the higher costs of debt, and also, you know, some of the the legislation changes, particularly in Victoria, that have impacted investors around you know, changes to the Tenancy Act and what that means for an investor. And so I do think that that we this is something that we need to really address. And, you know, we put this figure out that we estimate we need up to 70,000 dwellings across Australia just to balance Australia's rental market today. And as you said, it doesn't account for any future population growth. So to put that into context, 70,000 dwellings is like adding every single dwelling that is in the LGA of Newcastle to Australia's rental market. And you know, that visual representation just showcases that is not a quick fix. You know, this is a long term solution that we really need. And I think when I look at the rental market, more of us are renting, we're renting for longer. And it's really important that we we really look to create a rental market that is is stable and it offers uh, tenure, uh, you know, a length of tenure for, for tenants for that security. Security of tenure is the description I'm trying to land on here. Well, that's partly why the government has been encouraging build to rent, and they're suggesting that's going to provide a large amount of affordable accommodation. I'm not uncomfortable with the concept of uh, big corporations getting involved in providing accommodation because the government isn't. I'm not really thrilled that the government's giving them financial support to do that because somebody's got to be paying for that, and it's people like you and me who are property investors, but they're not giving us the same financial support. But I can't see that providing significant affordable accommodation. Interestingly, uh, Knight Frank came out with a report suggesting it could provide 50,000 apartments over the next five years. That's not going to move the needle at all. Mm -hmm. This is where there's no one solution. And I think built to rent is part of the solution, but there's other things like we haven't built enough social housing, which means that there are some vulnerable Australians in the private rental market that should be in social housing. You know, I think we need to ensure that we're building affordable dwellings for people to actually purchase and, you know, gain access to the housing market and move away from being a tenant. So I do think it it, it needs to be a multi-pronged approach. And you know, the housing accord, when you look at that, like I, I actually think it's really encouraging that governments are focused on supply and they've kind of got that North Star of 1.2 million homes over a five-year period. But, you know, it's a high level of homes to be provided and, you know, you need to see 240,000 dwelling starts every year over the next five years to meet that that 1.2 million target. And we've never in our history of Australia been able to create that each year. I think we got close one year, it was about 230 odd thousand. But I do think that I'm encouraged by the fact that governments are focused on supply. Well, they are, but the media is saying the government's going to build 1.2 million uh, houses. No, they're not. They've got, uh, <laughs> they're not going to lay the bricks. They're not going to fund it. What they're doing is encouraging it. And I like that idea and that's good. But there also has to be encouragement for the people who are going to take the commercial risk to do that. And I think one way of doing that is encouraging mum and dad investors back into the market because a moment ago you were hinting at the disincentives, the uncertainty that's coming from uh, the government's treating uh, property investors as an ATM and t- taxing them wherever they can. Or, and I've got no issue with changing legislation to, in general, make it fair for investors, but it's got to be fair for the landlords as well. 
I, I agree. And I, and I do think that Australia's rental market is a little bit unusual compared to kind of global standards because, you know, as you mentioned, large proportion of rental properties are provided by mum and dad investors. And these aren't investors that have multiple properties. They maybe have one or two, you know, so they we really need to view investors, mum and dad investors, like small business owners. And I do think, you know, they are painted in a negative light when actually we need more investment activity. You know, that's 70,000 figure showcases how many rental properties that we need. So we actually do need greater levels of investment participation across the market because we are not meeting the level of rental demand out there. You know, we have a uh, an undersupply, and that's not even capturing people who are underhoused. City Futures produced this research that suggests they estimated that 600,000 Australians are actually underhoused. So that means that they're, you know, not living in a, in a dwelling that suits their needs. They might be living in a caravan or, you know, on the streets or, you know, that is a, a, a large number of Australians. Well, interestingly, various reports have shown how investors are selling up more than they average uh, would on average. And I think one of the drivers of this exodus is investors aren't feeling in control of their assets. They're taking a commercial risk, but they're not sure that it's the results, the returns are worth it. Yeah, look, I, I think that has been an interesting trend that we have seen more there were investors. There talks of rental freezes and all that. Fortunately, that hasn't come out, but it keeps cropping up, doesn't it? It does. And, and I just think, you know, what investors want is certainty. They want to have certainty around their income, the costs involved in holding that property. And when you have some states and territories talking about and implementing higher taxes and levies, uh, particularly to investors, that's when investors get unnerved. That's when investors sell off or they opt to another state to invest rather than going to Queensland or Victoria, which seems to be the, the states that are banging their drum a little bit more in terms of higher levies and taxes to, to the investor sector. Now, we got sidetracked a bit talking about the rental market, <laughs> but that's fine. But what I'd like to ask you to finish off just the round off the rental side of things is we talked about rents rising, skyrocketing, to be blunt, and not rising as much now. What do you think's ahead? Can rents keep rising at this pace, considering that there's no end in sight? Because all the big apartment towers that we're going to need to build, all the medium density dwellings we're going to need to build, currently are costing too much to complete. And so they're not financially viable. And builders, developers are just having got the pipeline of new accommodation on the not only on the drawing boards but coming out of the ground that we need a lot of that, that on the drawing boards is not even going to be built until the market moves up another level yeah absolutely and then then you've got the recalibration overall of the sales market because you know that higher construction costs of units will feed into the established market too pushing prices higher and that re recalibration i think is is occurring now and will continue to occur over time but I think looking at where we are in the rental market, we're likely to see rents continue to rise. I'd probably caveat that Hobart and Canberra are the only cities that look in a better position than others for tenants. But I think with a vacancy rate at a record low, you know, Australia-wide, it's going to continue to put pressure on rents. I think we won't see them grow to the rate that we had been experiencing. I think that affordability ceiling is being reached by tenants. And what that means is they divert to cheaper alternatives. Or more people living in the same accommodation. Sorry to over talking, Nicola, which is what we said 20 minutes or so ago at the beginning of our chat, that rather than uh, living on my own in the apartment, I'm going to get a, somebody to co-tenant it and uh, share the expense. Absolutely. And, and I think that's that transient nature, more so in the rental market, because, you know, I, you know, it's easier to generally lease these at 12 months. And I think we're seeing that people are looking, how can I make uh, my living costs more affordable because I think it, it just, we've seen such a change in price point. Uh, and that feeds into the other aspect we were saying is in, you know, we're starting to see an increase in the number of people per dwelling across our combined capitals. So, yeah, look, rents are going to rise, but I don't think they'll rise at the rapid pace we were seeing, largely because of affordability ceilings and people trying to look for alternative options. Makes sense. Well, look, thank you. So we discussed two of your reports, but you've got a lot of extra data that you work on. And I know you give industry comment continuously to the media and to the industry. So looking ahead, what are the key takeaways from these reports for prospective home buyers, investors, and I guess even people considering selling? What do you see ahead for the property markets? 
Look, I think it's an interesting time. I think, you know, there is opportunity, no matter what is occurring in market dynamics. But at spring, you know, we have seen listings rise. I think for buyers out there, choice is now rising. We're still seeing our markets recovering. You know, we haven't really seen an impact overall on pricing around the fixed rate cliff and no material actually a decline in distressed listings. So I actually think, you know, off the back of everything else that's happened in terms of the change of interest rates in the economy, the housing markets have been incredibly, incredibly resilient. And I think, you know, for me, the, the the light is shining for 2024 in particular. I think, you know, when you look at the cash rate and when you look at the market implied yield curve, which is basically that probability of where cash rates are going to go, it's pricing in a cash rate cut around August of next year. And I do think that once we start to see uh, the cash rate coming down, it will really ignite housing market activity more so. And I think that's what we're likely to see over the second half of, of next calendar year in particular. So, yeah, look, I, I think the outlook is is certainly better than what some of the predictions were initially around our housing market. And, and I, I'll repeat, it's been so resilient and we've seen prices recover or recovering in, in some areas still. Now, I can uh, see that it's not as likely to grow as fast as it did this year. Double-digit growth at the beginning of a property cycle is unsustainable and it would create a much shorter cycle. So I'm much happier that price growth is moderating. But what I keep reading in the media is this suburb has suddenly got a new high. Other areas have reached their previous peaks. And as people realise that uh, now we're creating new records. Each market's now got new peaks. They're going to start to feel a sense of FOMO. That's happening a little bit already. Oops, not only have I missed the bottom, I've missed the opportunity to buy below uh, previous prices. So there seems to be more confidence from sellers and buyers. And let's be blunt, most sellers are buyers because they're upgrading or, or downsizing or being uh, moving uh, accommodation. So I'm looking forward to the markets of 2024. There will always be opportunities, but again, they're going to become very segmented, fragmented, and I look forward to keeping up to date with what's happening by having these regular chats with you. Dr. Nicola Powell from Domain, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you, Michael. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Dr. Nicola Powell. Now, if you did, and you don't currently follow or subscribe to this podcast, before we get on to the next couple of segments I want to share with you, just stop for a sec, and on whatever podcast you're at, just follow this show so that twice a week you're going to keep getting our regular information from me and my expert guests. By the way, as my way of saying thank you for anyone who's listening to me right now, if you go to podcastbonus.com.au and I'll leave a link in the show notes, I've got a heap of reports for you, just as my way of saying thank you, podcastbonus.com.au. Now, before I get on with my mindset message, I just want to continue on some of the thoughts we spoke a moment ago about what's ahead for our property markets. And I'm finding that a lot of people are still procrastinating. They're looking at the markets in the wrong way. They're reading that there's more properties coming on sale for the, at the moment in the springtime. And this is going to hold property price growth. Some people are saying because, you know, too many properties on the market. Others are saying unemployment's going to rise and that's going to cause mortgage stress. They still talk about the fixed rate mortgage cliff that's going to push more home buyers into mortgage stress. Not that that's happening. And yes, inflation is going to remain stubbornly high, meaning interest rates will remain a bit high for longer than we'd like. So these potential investors, these potential home buyers, they're just sitting on the sidelines. They're waiting. They're waiting for all the signs to improve before they move into their property market uh, ventures. On the other hand, strategic investors are taking a long-term view. They're not worried what interest rates are going to do, what the economy is going to be like in six months' time. They're making their plans based on where a housing market's going to be in five years or ten years' time. They see the increased properties for sale is more likely to be a reflection of the fact that sellers, who are also generally buyers, are growing more confident that interest rates have peaked. They also realise that property markets reset at the beginning of this year, as you've heard on this podcast, and they've now been rising for eight, nine months in a row. And the combination of FOMO, you know, fear of missing out in the market, severe shortage of properties to sell and to rent, and our extremely strong population growth is just going to keep property prices rising. 
And as we've said just a moment ago in the chat with Nicola, rents are going to keep rising. Despite all the government talk, we're still going to have a shortage of properties for a number of years. And when you combine all this together with the cost of increased construction of any new dwellings, there's no end in sight for rising property values. Actually, maybe that's why we've been seeing more investors and home buyers uh, who have been engaging our services at Metropole in the last couple of months. We've seen more than we have for a long, long time. I guess they realise that we're more than just a buyer's agent. At Metropole, we safely help our clients create intergenerational wealth through property. And we're big enough to tip the scales in your favour, yet we're still small enough to care. So why not go to metropole.com.au and have a complimentary chat with my team to explore your options. metropole.com.au Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In my mindset message today, I'd like to point out that you simply can't think your way to success. Now, you may have heard about the law of attraction, seen the movie The Secret, which talked about the law of attraction that says, just think about things and it's going to come and happen to you. Well, I don't know where their law of attraction's origins came from. They're a bit muddied. Some historians cite Buddha as the first to articulate the law. Others, Jesus. Look, no one really knows. But what we do know is the law of attraction first gained wide, I guess, worldwide recognition, thanks in part to Napoleon's book, you know, that famous book he wrote in 1937 called Think and Grow Rich. While Hill's version of the law of attraction was heavily weighted towards thinking, it nonetheless emphasised the importance of taking action on your thoughts. Thinking followed by action was Hill's message. Then in 2006, the law of attraction underwent major surgery thanks to a little book called The Secret. I remember when that came out. It was a big hit at the time. I think it sold over 19 million copies, uh, the book The Secret. Its popularity was anchored in the notion that thoughts become things. The Secret promised riches, success, happiness. It promised an amazing life. All you had to do was visualize what you wanted, and that simple act would attract it. The major surgery performed by The Secret was in removing the organs of action from the patient. No work, no hardship, no obstacles, no goals, no mistakes, no failure. For the first time, a self-help book offered success without all the effort. With its millions of devoted followers, you'd naturally expect to see an explosion in the number of millionaires since 2006. But that didn't happen. Why? Because the real secret is that visualization does not attract that which you desire. The purpose of visualization is clarity. Visualization or thinking in pictures about the life you desire forces the conscious and subconscious parts of your mind to work in harmony in revealing or making clear the path you've got to take in order to produce the life you desire. Clarity is knowing exactly what you want in life and what you need to do to get what you want. Clarity reveals the path you must take. It provides the blueprint for the life you desire. But the blueprint's just a plan. Executing the plan requires effort. It requires action. So the message I want to get to you today is you simply can't think your way to success. Now, again, Napoleon Hill wrote the book Think and Grow, which he did talk about action. But if he had called the book Think and Take Action and Work Really Hard and Find a Product or Service People Want to Pay a Lot of Money For and Then Work Your Guts Out and Grow Rich, he probably wouldn't have sold as many books. So again, the message today is you simply can't think your way to success. But it's the first step then you've got to take action. Well, thanks for spending the last little while with me, and I hope you got some benefit from this show. If you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there's three little buttons down the bottom, press it and share it, or just tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour and you'll definitely be doing me a favour and helping me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. 
Now, there's ways of catching up with me between these shows. Just look for Michael Yardney on social media, or why not join my private Facebook group? Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I have a way of saying thank you to you for subscribing to this podcast. Go to podcastbonus.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where you can get a bunch of ebooks and reports. My way of saying thank you. And when you've got time, why not listen to some of the old podcasts? There's individual lessons in each of those that I think would be helpful for you. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?